All right, how are we all? Good. <laughs> Woo! Yeah. <laughs> so today, um, I just want to say, yeah, thank you all uh, for being here. I know it's really early in the morning, but we want to get pumped to get to it. Uh, I just flew in from Melbourne yesterday, so I know what you guys are thinking. You're like, ooh, a Melbourneite. I don't know if we can trust you. So don't worry. I know there's a battle between the two cities. I was originally from Sydney. I lived here for a good 10 years. Well, that's okay then. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm part of you guys. You know, I'm an honoree. Uh, so just before we head into it, I just want to ask you guys who here considers themselves a creative, so a writer, musician, it's your passion, you do a creative job. If you just put your hand up so I can see who is here, go on, don't be shy. Okay. All right. It's creative mornings. Okay. So I'm guessing everybody here is a creative person. Um, and for this year, it's the end of the month already. Uh, it's a new year. It, it's kind of the time of the year when our New Year's resolutions start to kind of fade. And uh, we're like, you know what, I'll just, you know, I'll get it next year. It's all right. I'll start again later. Um, but it is the year of the pig. And we're going to get it in 2019. And we're really going to collectively get it, hustle, and get this bread in 2019. <laughs> So by get this bread, I mean we're just going to try and get into the mindset of like really crushing it this year. So I'm hoping by putting that energy out to you guys, that also comes to me. This is a place where we can all grow and feel, I don't know, some power, some energy, and grow together. Um, I love this gif of, Liz of Lizzie McGuire being baller. Uh, so the theme for the month is surreal. Uh, when I was thinking about Surreal, it was a little bit daunting for me. Uh, it's such a big topic. I'm sure you guys have just seen today. You're like, what is Surreal? That's a little bit difficult for me to kind of get into. So for me, I mean, the very first thing that I thought as an artist is Salvador Dali. Um, I'm not a fan of Dali. It's OK if you guys are. I won't judge you. Um, I think he's a bit of a show off. You can see by that ridiculous title in the name of this painting that he's a show off. Not a fan of Dali, but you know, first impressions. My boy, Magritte, I'm much more of a fan of him. Um, yeah, he is neat, designery. If, if anybody here is a designer, you might like the neatness, the tightness of his work. Um, so when I was trying to get into the mindset of what surreal is, some other words that came to mind were Bizarre, weird, strange, freakish, dreamlike. Dreamlike's a good one. So I want you all to kind of get into the mindset of being a little bit freaky. Um, but when you really define it, when I looked it up, it means the elements combined in a strange way that you would not normally expect, like a dream. So I hope everybody here has had a dream, maybe a really weird dream. It's OK if you haven't had a dream. I know a couple of people who don't have the capabilities of dreaming. That's all right. My dreams are very lame. Um, but uh, when with these two surrealists uh, that I mentioned, what they really have in common is, other than being part of a 1930s art movement, uh, they're not abstract painters, right? They're not painting big blocks of color like Rothko. They're painting things that we know, that we're familiar with, um, things that are otherworldly. Uh, so really, reality with a twist. Uh, so you can really sum it up as fact plus fantasy equals surreal. So how does this relate to my work? Um, today, I'm going to talk about the factual parts of my career and the fantasy parts, and all together accumulating into one big surreal awesome experience. So let's start with the facts. I know you guys are like, OK, are you going to introduce yourself? She's been talking for a minute. Is she going to talk about herself? Don't worry, we're going to be pretty well acquainted by the end of this. All right. What and who is Zeke's lunchbox? Bit of a weird one. It's kind of hard for people who aren't uh, maybe street artists to kind of wrap their mind around. But um, I am Julia, or Zeke's lunchbox. You can call me either or. I have a lot of people who 
think that that's my name. They, my art persona is Zeke, so people are like, oh my gosh, I called you Zeke, I'm so sorry. That's fine, you can call me Julia or Zeke. Please don't call me Julie with an IE. That really annoys me, that's not my name. Um, so my, it's my art pseudonym, that's what Zeke's Lunchbox is, but it's also a brand. Uh, it's a mood, a vibe, as the young kids like to say, it's an aesthetic. Uh, you may hear that word around quite a lot. Really annoyed me when I first heard it, but then I just started using it way too often. Um, so under this, I'm an artist. I would say, I've been doing it for about five years now properly, so I would say, yeah, I, I would hold that title pretty well and confidently. Um, designer, this one I'm not too confident with, but I do have to make that bread, so being a designer is pretty essential as well. And YouTuber, now I know what you're all thinking. I've always wanted to meet a YouTuber, said no one. Um, <laughs> Uh, now, YouTube is a bit of a weird one, um, especially in Australia. The, this is something that's like, I don't know, when you're self-employed and really prepping yourself up, it's something, a culture that's not really accepted or, uh, yeah, kind of loved in Australia. So YouTube is really a very narcissistic kind of career. But also, I'm an artist, so I am a narcissist. Um, so. Zeke's Lunchbox, I know people are like, that name is pretty weird. Uh, where did that come from? I really wish I could tell you uh, that I had an awesome story about how Zeke's Lunchbox came about. Uh, the truth is that I've just been using it, that name, since MySpace. Anybody here from, you know, if anybody here is that old, hopefully everyone here is that old. If you don't know what MySpace is, I'm feeling incredibly old right now. Um, and I was a bit of a stoner as a kid, I'm not going to lie secrets out. Um, and that name has just been around because I thought it was cool and trippy. And it's kind of just stuck around. But it's mostly stuck around because I love the meaning of what Zeke's lunchbox is. So Zeke, I'm imagining, is an alien creature, wild, colorful, loud, really in your face. So try and imagine a pretty uh, exuberant alien character. And lunchbox, cute, childlike, uh, really innocent. These two things are really dueling it out, balancing one another. So I am a Libra. I would love for you guys to find a Libra who doesn't constantly say, I'm a Libra. Um, so I really love duality, seeing both sides and balance. When I don't have balance, I feel really off kilter and I'm always seeking balance in my work. Okay. So if you guys haven't seen any of my work and I have to pitch it to you, um, it's kind of like pitching a movie. So it's like Jurassic Park meets Wizard of Oz. You know, you're kind of getting a bit of a mindset of what that is. So for me, the easiest way to describe Zeke's Lunchbox is H.R. Giga, if you don't know his work, he is most notably known for doing um, the artwork for the movie Alien. Um, you know, so sexual, uh, gritty, really otherworldly, kind of creepy. So HR Giga meets My Little Pony. <laughs> yeah, this gift made me pretty happy when I found it. Um, so, you know, those two dueling things, really extreme ends and kind of coming together to describe what Zeke's Lunchbox is about. Another example I've got is Garbage Pail Kids. If you guys are around my age, so late 20s, early 30s, you may remember the Garbage Pail Kids. Uh, you know, they're gooey, kind of in your face, a little bit grotesque. So grotesque meets Polly Pocket, really sweet, cute, uh, contained, almost like a lunchbox, so that's pretty appropriate. Now, we're going to get to know each other, and uh, t I'm going to tell you a little bit of personal history about myself. This sassy kid up the top here, pretty fun, but never really good at school. Um, I, I think uh, my family always encouraged creativity, which I'm very grateful for. Uh, they always gifted me for Christmas and birthdays. They gave me like art supplies and papers. Um, but as a kid, I always felt pretty misunderstood and like I wasn't communicating exactly what I felt. And uh, teenage astroturf hair Julia 
uh, <laughs> um, she was pretty lonely as a kid as well. Uh, I was pretty depressed, yeah, depressed teenager. Very, those two things go together. Um, and pretty suicidal, and I really had a pretty tough time as a kid and teenager. And uh, I always gravitated towards creative things, and um, I knew by the end of high school I needed to do a course that was creative. There's no other option for me. I had to do a creative course. Maybe some of you guys are the same, um, and that's why you've kind of leaned towards being a creative person. So I knew at this time when I went to uni, um, I wanted to do art, but everybody around me was saying, you can't do art. Art's not going to pay the bills. You're not going to make a living with that. So as a young person, you listen to adults, maybe, sometimes. And I chose my second choice, which was fashion and textiles. Um, and at this point, I was really excited to go to uni because I was finally going to find my tribe, people that really understood me. And we were going to grow together. And I don't know, maybe you guys have gone to a creative course where you're like, I'm, I'm super excited to meet other creatives. Um, unfortunately for me, the fashion industry does not have my tribe. Uh, as you can see, I'm a very colorful person. If you see my friends, they're very colorful. And uh, the fashion industry in Australia anyway is very sleek very neat, very designy, and that wasn't the choice for me. So this photo here, um, which I had a real fun time finding this photo, because there was a whole other list of photos of me and my friends really hating university, going to the computer labs late one night, getting drunk at school, being naughty kids. The two bottom examples here are two um, by the way, I went to the University of Technology, which is monolithic now, can I just say? Huge. Um, these two projects on the bottom, projects that really didn't represent me, I felt pretty lost creatively. Uh, when I first went to uni, the very first thing that they told us was, we're going to break you down, but hopefully we're going to build you back up in time before you graduate, which is such a sweet thing to say to a creative person. <laughs> so at this point, after uni, I stuck it out. Um, I had been a quitter my whole life, so I knew with uni it was like, this is my redemption. I'm just going to finish something uh, for once in my life. So I stuck it out, but I was really lost in the end. And I wasn't sure where I was going to go with my life. Um, and I dug really deep. I thought I wasn't a creative person after this course, by the way. Uh, it really broke me down. So I dug deep inside where this strength came from. I have no idea. But uh, I chose to pursue art and just really give it one year. I keep telling myself at the beginning of the year, OK, I'm going to give it one year and reassess. Five years on, I'm still doing the same thing. So I guess I'm you know, able to stay afloat. At um, this point, I was trying to find inspiration, things that really spoke to me, things that made me feel not so lonely. Um, I've seen a few people who have found inspiration in places where they don't feel so lonely. And for me, where I didn't feel lonely was through cinema. And specifically, I found solace in films like The Fifth Element. If anybody, yeah, anyone here seen it? I love The Fifth Element because this movie really spoke to me. It was like, wow, look at this world. It's kind of depressing, kind of colorful, really fun, playful, humorous. Um, another example I have is The Labyrinth. The Labyrinth, really weird movie. Um, David Bowie doing his thrusty dances, throwing babies up in the air. Um, I loved the world that Jim Henson, the creator of uh, all these puppets, Sesame Street and everything, I love the world that he created with his characters. Uh, and another weird one, I don't know if many people have seen this movie, maybe? Yes, yes. Um, I am obsessed with David Cronenberg, who is a director of this movie. Uh, he's pretty weird um, with a lot of what he does, but uh, I, for me, when I first saw this movie, it was really unique and really twisted, a little bit sexual. 
and it really spoke to me. So what these three movies have in common is world building. And world building really resonated with me at this point. So I asked myself, what does Zeke's world look like? What does my world look like? And I decided at this point to have my solo show. And in my solo show, oh, before we head into that, we're going to talk about the fantasy section in our formula. So let's dive into fantasy land. So uh, this piece here, not a great example of what I'm capable of, but it is a good example of what I need to discuss and break down. For me, when I was discovering Zeke's world, I was kind of imagining myself uh, as a scientist, as a botanist, uh, somebody who was collecting data. So uh, for me, this piece was a really good index for me to constantly refer back to of the elements that lived in my world. So Christopher Marley's um, photo here wasn't a direct inspiration. I just wanted to show it just so you understand exactly what I'm going for and yeah, the mood and the vibe I'm going for. Uh, so here, the Zeke Hotel. Uh, I'm imagining myself as still exploring my planet, my world, and I'm in a hotel, peeking into lots of different rooms, and um, I've discovered that it's a sex hotel, and all these weird nefarious acts, uh, devious acts, are occurring in this hotel. Now, the first piece here, um, Voyeur, uh, back in 2014, uh, this piece is my favorite piece in the series because it does hold a little bit of mysticism, a little bit of yeah, just a bit of mystery to it. You're wondering what sex act she's looking at. Um, and this is the point in the talk where I'd like to talk, ask somebody, what creepy sex act you think she's looking at? No, I won't ask you, don't worry. Um, <laughs> uh, so blow, I'm imagining to this blow up doll, um, I like to anthropomorphize a lot of uh, characters and a lot of um, inanimate objects. I'm imagining these two things fornicating together, creating weird goo. Um, it's, meant, it's not that serious. It's meant to be fun, playful. I'm, I'm imagining them making lots of squeaky, squishy sounds. Um, dot, I don't know if you can imagine that, yeah. Um, dot, pretty obvious. You feel, you're doing your thing. You feel like you're constantly being watched. Maybe because you kind of are by, wait, who, who's our FBI? Anyway. Um, <laughs> Now, Bukaki, if you guys know what Bukaki is, um, I know that you're a perv and you're my favorite kind of person. Uh, I'm not going to explain what Bukaki is. You're all adults and you can look that up. <laughs> now, Blobby Baby. Um, this was my biggest piece in my first solo show. Uh, again, you're seeing the HR Giga um, Garbage Pail Kids meets Polly Pocket. These two things kind of contrasting one another. Um, I really loved this phase in my career, but I knew that I needed to be memorable in a sense. And I didn't want to be an artist that, was, that, that you just didn't feel anything towards. That was my biggest nightmare. I wanted you to either love my work or hate it. Because either way, I've made you feel something. So when people hate my work, that makes me happy. Because um, I've, got, I've gotten into your psyche a little bit. Uh, but with this stage, I kind of found myself being a little bit lost again. And I have kind of felt like I was making art for other people. I was making art to be kind of controversial, uh, really breaking down what you're kind of expecting. And also at this stage, I, ha I have to make money too, right? You're probably wondering, how you make money from this? This is wild. Um, so I was lost and I needed to find, whenever I'm lost, I always try and harken back to times that made me really happy and really inspired me. And I, I really recommend always trying to dig deep to those kind of memories to push you further. So going down the line here, I've got a She-Ra poster. I don't know if maybe if you guys are a little bit older, you might remember She-Ra. Uh, pretty much a cartoon just to made, made to sell toys, which has totally worked because I want all of the toys. Um, Pokemon up the top, 
uh, ex you know, a real extended universe, lots of different characters, a very varied world. My Little Pony here, um, I only just found out recently that My Little Pony had different animals in it, and I can just tell you right now, that knowledge in, it, in of itself has kept me inspired for a good three weeks now. It, I'm living. <laughs> now, with Sailor Moon, this is, I think, the best example of what I'm trying to push here. With Sailor Moon, if you guys remember watching it as a kid, uh, if you don't know Sailor Moon, it's a cartoon anime from the 80s, 90s. Um, every single time they would introduce a new character, it was like Christmas. It was like, oh my god, now she's orange? Um, <laughs> so that feeling and that childlike sensibility, that inspiration, that pure, honest joy is exactly what I wanted to try and connect with. And uh, I really wanted to try and grasp that in a way. Uh, at this stage, again, I knew I had to make money. I had to be a little bit commercial, alter myself just a little bit. I knew that animals online, very viral, really cute, very popular. So I wanted to combine these two things together. And uh, I've taken a long time discovering these characters. And now I finally found all the characters that reside in Zeke's world. So here are some of the Zeke creatures. Um, Cottontail, very sweet, innocent, a little bit useless. Um, floaties, uh, you know, just swimming and eating. Real simple stuff. I, don't, I think we always are overcomplicating artwork and it really should just be about honesty and really staying true to just simple thoughts. So um, swimming and eating, who doesn't love doing that? Great. Teddy. Teddy is one of my favorite characters that I've made because uh, I feel like so many people relate to Teddy. I have a lot of people who have uh, commented online and said, why did you draw this picture of me? This is really rude. <laughs> um, Mystical Menagerie. I'm imagining this is a very heroic piece. Uh, they're characters who have just come back from a battle, and this is their portrait. And they're heroic, but also adorable. Baby Baphomet is a pretty fun one for me. Um, if you don't know what a Baphomet is, it is kind of a imagining of the devil. Um, for me, uh, he's got a little bit of blood on the tip of his horn. So for me, I'm imagining that he's fresh from a kill and he's prancing about it and he's very happy with himself. Um, Fun fact with Baby Baphomet, I don't know if you guys remember Avant Card. Avant Card used to be, they used to print lots of artworks uh, on postcards and they would have them across um, in lots of cafes. So I was lucky enough to sneak in for the very last run of Avant Card. So this card, postcard here was printed I think 100,000 times and distributed across Australia. So I had lots of weird peeps taking photos. Oh wow, look what I found, just discovered this artist. Pretty fun. Um, okay, so now I finally, I've had, I, I've collected all the data. I've got all my information on all the elements that reside in my world. I've got all the characters. Now I finally have formed my worlds. I'm really happy to say that this, I think, is the final reincarnation of what Zeke's world looks like. And I'm really excited to explore more of this in the future. I'm imagining this piece as you're charging up for battle. What that battle may be is really up to you. Um, Hypnos, this piece was a really fun commission that I got. Uh, the brief was to make a piece um, based on the movie The Labyrinth. So the two characters are really inspired by Jim Henson's uh, puppets and Jennifer Connelly kind of popped in the middle. What they're being hypnotized, for me is really fun because I'm imagining David Bowie off in the corner doing a little hippie dance. Um, so yeah, I really love the playfulness in this piece. And you can also tell, uh, if you're looking at examples of my older work, the colors were really deep and dark. And the colors in this one um, are a lot more lighter. I'm a lot more comfortable. I don't have to be so harsh. And yeah, things are a little bit more flowy. So you're probably wondering, uh, how I make money as well. Lots of people like to be like, so how, how do you make money? 
uh, how does this work? Um, which is funny. Uh, <laughs> so now that I've got my identity, I need to monetize Zeke's lunchbox. So a few ways that I've done that has been through making merch. I do have a background in fashion, so um, that is something that I want to do a lot more in the future. Uh, these leggings here are um, a print that I've done of some of my artwork. Um, now these uh, examples here aren't exactly my most you know, notable. I just think for me these are the most Zeke looking things. Um, so the design in the middle is a roller fit, uh, a t-shirt I did for Roller Fit, which is a sk skating company across Australia. Uh, I thought this one was a really playful, fun design. Uh, I also have a collaboration with Personnel, um, Person Nail, and uh, these, these nails here also glow in the dark as well, which is pretty on brand for my whole 80s, 90s nostalgia vibe. Okay, so the best way for me that I've been able to connect with a wider audience has been YouTube. Um, YouTube has been insane, and I've only been doing it for about a year, but it has been able to grasp people all over the world. Um, I mostly, I'm gonna be honest, mostly my clients are from the US. Uh, the US has a huge, massive market that's perfect for niches. So if you have something that's super niche, tap into that US market. Um, so over the last year, I've built my 9,000 subs. Uh, I was at eight in December, so I imagine next month I'll be at 10 soon. So it is really, really quick. And the way is, uh, I love YouTube because it's a space where you're really talking about yourself. You have full control to tell your own story, set the mood. It's really your space online to pitch your story. So the ways that I've made money through YouTube have been through selling merch, getting commissions, getting design jobs. The videos themselves have started to pay, which is great, so Google pays me um, once a month. And uh, I also have affiliate links, so I'm sure, as you guys have seen, lots of influencers out there have affiliate links. You get a little percentage every single time someone buys something or clicks something. And all of that kind of accumulates. Um, and I'm really excited to just keep growing that, keep growing Zeke's world, keep growing my YouTube and finding more people online. So I just want to say thank you to everybody. Uh, you guys have been really awesome and thank you very much for laughing at my dumb jokes. Um, <laughs> and I just, uh, I, if you could take one thing away from hearing my story, it's that you need to be honest and true to your gut and listen to your inner voice. Uh, because when you do amazing, surreal things happen. And I just want to wish you all a great journey on your creative journey. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, one more round of applause. Woohoo! Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Zeke. Seek slash Julia. Um, so we're going to do a bit of a Q&A. So guys, get your questions ready. Oh, and I do have some stream time socks. So think of a question and the first two people that um, ask a question will we'll get some very cool socks. I'll go and get them in a second. Um, but I'm going to start. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start because I've got the mic. So um, I'm going to um, ask you this question. And that is that you talked before about... Um, uh, y your, you know, your work really is surreal in terms of, and, and that your life in terms of this fact plus, plus fantasy, and that's this surreal space that you're in. And I'm imagining, you know, during the day, you're creating these incredible characters and you're going into some very interesting place, right, mentally. And then you've got to pack stuff up and ship it and, and you know, go to the bank or do all this, like, left brain kind of stuff. So... You know, how do you um, go from fantasy back to fact and then back to fantasy and back to... Like, how do you kind of do that? Is it that um, it's you're doing it at different times or do you find you're able to switch between being in that super creative fantasy world and then living the life of the artist that needs to make money? And Yeah, how do you do that? Um, I think for me it's a little bit tricky to get 
into the mindset of it. So I try and plan every single week or every single day as like, this is a packing day, this is like the day where I do admin stuff, and then this is a full creative day. Um, sometimes that doesn't really work out, so I'm weaving. Uh, it, it, it is for me a lot nicer to be one day or the other, but um, yeah, sometimes you just have to be a bit hard on yourself and just really force yourself to do it and get into the mindset, which is just a little bit of practice. But yeah, you just have to be, you just have to work hard, really. <laughs> Yes. Right, so we've got one there and one there, and you guys get the you get amazing thought. So just come sit me after. Well, actually, you just um, ask, and then if you repeat the question. Okay. okay. So you, ask, so you, Julian. Uh, <laughs> do you have uh, any projects coming up? Oh, yes. Thank you, Julian, my business partner, um, for asking that question. Um, yes. I knew, I, I knew as soon as I wouldn't... Okay. First of all, let me start by saying I'm working on a really big tarot card project and uh, it's absolutely massive. Uh, it was Julian's conception um, and he came to me and, you know, we wanted to do this big, massive project. It's taken a lot longer than we thought, and um, but it has been really amazing and I'm really excited to see what that is all about. Um, so, yeah, if you guys sign up to the mailing list, you'll be notified of all the Zeke's Lunchbox tarot stuff, but I really hope we can get it done within the next year or so. So yes, thank you, Julian, for that question. And, um, that and if you just repeat the question. Yeah. Can you tell us a bit about your work? So, sorry? Can you tell us a bit about your work, so doing those YouTube videos? How do you plan them? Okay. How do you execute them? How do you right. record them? Okay. So, sorry, what was your name? Raphael, thank you for that. So Raphael asked uh, how I go about making a YouTube video, how do I plan it, um, all of that. The best thing about YouTube, putting your stuff out online, is that you've got a test group right there who are going to tell you exactly what they want. So you need to be connecting and constantly listening to what your audience wants. My audience is always like, make a blending video, do this, please talk about this, which is fantastic because I'm giving them exactly what they want. Uh, in terms of prepping for it, I do have a massive list of videos that I need to make. Um, I try to batch film two at a time. So I have a whole day where I put on makeup. It's pretty much the only time I put on real clothes because I work from home. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure a few people who work from home know what that feels like. Um, and then uh, I've got my just Canon camera. It's got a flip screen, a good mic, and um, some lights, natural lighting, just start to film and talk to the camera. I have to say, it was pretty nerve-wracking the first couple of times doing it. It's so weird how like, you're literally just talking to yourself in a room, but you're so stressed about it. Uh, maybe if you're a musician, you're recording something, you can kind of uh, yeah, relate to that. Um, was there anything else? Sorry, was there anything else, Raphael? That was it? How do I edit? Um, I edit through Adobe Premiere Pro. Um, and not only do I put my work out on YouTube, but I learn a lot of stuff through YouTube. So I'm connecting a lot with other creators on YouTube. So um, yeah, they're teaching me, I teach them. It's a really good creative community. All right, next one. Yes. be found. Okay. So what was your name? Carrie. Carrie, thank you. Uh, Carrie asked, um, uh, there's a lot of channels on YouTube, so how did I find my voice on YouTube? How did I put myself out there on YouTube? Um, with YouTube, it's all about consistency. With making content online, it's all about consistency. If you're an influencer or uh, blogger or anything, you know how hungry the internet is for content. They just want it all the time. I try and post once a week. Posting once a week um, is pretty slow in terms of YouTube's world, but uh, for me, it's um, that's the only thing that's going to work for me. So posting consistently has been really essential. Uh, because people will may find your video here and there, and then they go to your channel, they see that you're a regular uploader, so they're like, okay, I'm going to subscribe because I'll see you every week. Um, and then I th also think for me, I think 
Artists are very secretive, so I wanted to kind of break that down. I find like the creative industry is very secretive in general. Uh, maybe lots of industries are like that, but uh, I wanted to break that down and that honesty, people could see that I was breaking that down, so I think people really connected with my honesty. Sometimes I'm a little too honest. Um, and I also think YouTube was an untapped resource, so uh, I just I was seeing a lot of other artists on there, but they're a little bit more folksy. There was no one who was like really loud and vivacious, so I just knew that there was a little gap in there for me to kind of sneak into. <laughs> yes, Anna. <laughs> Mm -hmm. like, I just wanted to know if since you've you know, grown and evolved and developed so much as an artist, has that changed? Do you mm -hmm. now have like a longer view for the future? I would mm -hmm. say that you would. Yes. Still in it. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Anna. Thank you so much, Anna, random stranger yeah. that I don't know at all. Um, so Anna asked, uh, I, so since I reassess every single year what I do and if I'm going to do it for a whole other year, uh, so Anna asked like what the prerequisites for that are. Um, I think for me, I set a couple of goals. So, weirdly enough, a goal for this year was to speak publicly. It's weird, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Nicole, for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh my God, there is so much lipstick on this mic. I'm sorry. Um, uh, yeah. So I have a list of goals. You want to make them kind of reasonable. Um, I, I kind of just put that energy out there. I'm very much somebody who is about putting energy out because once you ask, it's really corny, but it's like ask, receive and believe. It's so, so corny, but it's true and it's been really useful for me. So I usually at the beginning of the year, I'll write a list of things I want to accomplish and usually I've accomplished them mostly because I've made them happen, but then sometimes things just pop up like this talk. Um, so, uh, I, my long-term goal is, and why I've, re, why I've just kept on going, is um, things just keep on getting bigger and bigger. Like, as soon as the, fol the following is still there and it keeps growing, it's not, stay it's not plateaued or, at all. I keep getting more commissions, more um, random design jobs, and lots of opportunities that I didn't even think would come up have come up. And it's just kept on growing every single year. So um, it's also, I feel like I'm doing myself a disservice when I'm saying, when I, if I just give up, because I've been doing it for so long. And if I just give up now, I'm like, oh, it almost feels like a bit of a waste. It's like, I'm almost there. I'm almost to that comfortable stage. So um, I don't know if I'll ever get there. Maybe that's good. So I just keep on going. Yeah. Right, Hi. One, one last question. Okay. <laughs> um, how do you go about getting your finished artwork? Mm -hmm. uh, what was your name? L. L. Thank you, L, um, for that question. So L was asking, how do I go about a final piece to then getting it up online and through a print? And um, so were you asking how I capture the paintings? So like scanning or phot photography? OK. Um, so with a final piece, I, and particularly a painting, um, I usually photograph it. Uh, or, and then with paperwork, I'll scan it. Um, in terms of making a print, um, I used to do high quality prints, but because I am still quite a small artist, I just didn't feel like that margin was really worth it for me. Uh, so I have just been printing with a local printer since then. And um, the prints are so cheap anyway, so uh, I feel like that's, uh, I just knew the, what the price mark was and the customer wouldn't spend, you know, an insane amount of money. So I just wanted to keep costs low and then, yeah, then that, that price would stay that same. I hope that answered the question. Okay. All right. Awesome. <laughs>